Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, on uh, behalf of the Department of Communication, University of Hyderabad, I welcome you all to the 12th Dr. CVS Sharma Memorial Lecture. Uh, a big and special welcome to our speaker, Mr. A.K. Bhattacharya, uh, who, as you all know, is currently the uh, editorial director of Business Standard. We thank him profusely for accepting our invitation to deliver the talk today. Uh, before I give a formal introduction to the distinguished guest, uh, let me tell you a little about the department and the CVS Memorial Lecture. Uh, the Department of Communication was established, as many of you here probably know, uh, uh, in the, at the University of Hyderabad in 1988. And over the last 30 plus years, it has emerged as a premier public university department for higher learning in the field of journalism, communication and media studies nationally. Uh, the Department of Communication has been ranked the best public university department six times in a row by the Outlook and the India Today surveys uh, that evaluate uh, academic uh, institutions. And it tops the charts, uh, especially in terms of academic excellence. Uh, the Dr. C.V.S. Uh, Sharma Memorial Lecture Series, organized by the department, celebrates uh, the memory of our esteemed colleague uh, who played an important role in laying the groundwork uh, for the department. It's a tribute to Dr. C.V.S. Sharma, who was one of the first uh, faculty members recruited to the Department of Communication at Sarojini Naidu School of Fine Arts, Performing Arts, and Communication. This was in 1987. We now call it uh, SN School of, communication, of Arts and Communication. And at that time, it was disciplines. Uh, uh, the school had not been divided into these four departments, as it is now. Um, CVS, as we usually refer to him, graduated with a Master's in Communication and Journalism from Osmania University. He taught for a couple of years at the Padmavati Mahila Vishwavidyale in Tirupati before moving back to Hyderabad to join the University of Hyderabad where he also did his PhD. Uh, he was known for his innovative approach to teaching visual aspects of communication and script writing. Uh, apart from teaching these courses that is script writing and television analysis, uh, CVS also wrote fiction. Some of his work appeared in the South Asian online journal Sulekha and was dramatized uh, on All India Radio 2. He passed away after an extended battle with cancer in 2006 at the age of 48. Uh, at today's event, uh, we are also missing uh, uh, CVS Sharma's father uh, who passed away last year. He, Mr. Murthy uh, made it a point to join us every year for the memorial lecture. Uh, Every year, we've also been inviting a distinguished communication scholar, journalist, filmmaker, media person, or critic to deliver this lecture. Uh, we started with Theodor Bhaskaran in 2007, uh, and the speakers have included Amu Joseph, H.K. Dua, Colin McAbey, Paranjoy Guha Thakurta, A.R. Venkat Chalapati, uh, A.S. Paneer Selvan, Sunil Abraham, uh, Dinesh Sharma, Pamela Philippos, and last year it was Shekhar Kamula. The, this year we have amongst us a distinguished and seasoned journalist, columnist, editor, and editor, Mr. A.K. Bhattacharya, doing the honors. Uh, I deem it my privilege to read a brief introduction of our speaker before I invite him for the talk. Uh, uh, about his journey in the field of journalism, and I'm sure many of you here again are quite familiar with that. Uh, but just to give a formal introduction, Mr. A.K. Bhattacharya, uh, AKB is what he prefers to be called, uh, especially by friends. He's currently the editorial director of Business Standard, uh, one of the best known financial dailies. Uh, he's a distinguished fellow at the Ananta Aspen Center India, and, which is a think tank, and a member of the two track strategy, two track, sorry, track two strategic dialogues between India and China and between India and Singapore. Uh, tracing now his uh, four decades in journalism, a journey that started when he switched careers uh, after a year of teaching in uh, Delhi University College, which he says uh, uh, probably should have been the other way around. He says I should have. Uh, been a journalist and then become an academic. 
Um, he joined the Financial Express in 1978, where he worked for 10 years, including three years in Kolkata as its chief of news bureau. Uh, AKB set the bar for business reporting when he joined the Economic Times in 1988 and functioned as its chief of bureau from 1990 to 1993. He then joined the Pioneer as executive editor in 1994 and was its editor in 1995-96. He moved to Business Standard in 96 as editor of news services and was the resident editor in Mumbai from July 96 to 97. His next tenure was as managing editor of Business Standard between 98 to 2000 and then he was managing the entire group for over 11 years. And he oversaw the newspaper's news operations and editorial uh, administration. Between November 2011 and uh, July 2016, he was the editor of Business Standard and now continues on its board as the editorial director. Uh, besides wearing these different hats and holding all these positions and responsibilities, uh, since 1990, AKB has also been writing a regular column, New Delhi Diary, commenting on the government affairs. Uh, since 1997, he has been uh, writing another column, Rai Sina Hill, commenting on developments and issues concerning bureaucracy. Uh, he was the winner of the Sri Ram Lifetime Achievement, Achievement Award for Excellence in Financial Journalism in 2017. Uh, he is the author of uh, the book, The Rise of Goli Goliath, 12 Disruptions That Changed India. This was published very recently and this is published by Penguin. Um, Okay, so his topic for today, which all of you know, of course, is who killed Indian media, a post-mortem report uh, uh, and the road ahead. So it kind of uh, reminded me of Neil Postman, uh, uh, best known for his term uh, media ecology He's from NYU. NYU. He's argued in his book, uh, Amusing Ourselves to Death. Uh, Postman has said that when a population becomes directed by trivia, when cultural life is redefined as a perpetual round of entertainments, when serious public conversation becomes a form of baby talk, when in short, a people become an audience and their public business, uh, a vaudeville uh, uh, act, a nation finds, it, uh, finds itself at risk. Cultural death is a possibility. So in a talk, in his talk today, A.K. Bhattacharya goes a step further to, ass to assess the existential challenges that media itself faces in its present form. His contention is that all is not lost. So if you were thinking he's actually written the obituary of uh, uh, media, that's not what he's doing. So let us listen to him to find out the possibilities for media to come out of its uh, current crisis. So presenting for you on this stage, A.K. Bhattacharya, to deliver the Dr. CVS Memorial Lecture 2019. Uh, thank you, uh, Kanchan, for that very generous uh, introduction of mine. I felt a little embarrassed that I have been guilty of so many things. Uh, um, and also, uh, I'm grateful to you for having lifted the mystery in a sense that those of us here were worrying that I'm going to announce the obituary of Indian media. I'm not going to do that. So, um, I deem it uh, as an honor and a privilege to be invited to address the prestigious Dr. C. V. S. Sharma Memorial Lecture at the August Department of Communication of the University of Hyderabad. Dr. Sharma was a multifaceted personality. Apart from being a teacher, he was also a writer of fiction, as Kanchan just now told us. I did not have the privilege of knowing him in person or having interacted with him. But I am aware of his erudition and teaching work in media studies and how they have raised him to an iconic level in academia. His innovation in teaching methods, I am told, made him not only popular among students, but he also set new standards of pedagogy, which others following him have hugely benefited from. His untimely death 
was a big loss for the world of media studies in particular and the academic fraternity in general. The topic that I am going to speak on today is deliberately provocative. The question, who killed the Indian media, presupposes that Indian media has already been killed and we are here to identify the killers, outline what led to its assassination and what future remedial steps should be taken. Students of media studies will find little time to conclude that this is the worst form of presumptuous journalism. Nothing could be worse than this and that too in a lecture that is being delivered to celebrate the work and memory of Dr. C. V. S. Sharma. So without further ado, what I intend to do now is to first try to establish if the Indian media at all has been killed and if so, what all factors are responsible for its sudden demise if it is so. And if it is not killed yet, what state is the media in? Have we reached a point where the Indian media may be killed soon? Who could be its potential killers? And what should we do to safeguard the Indian media against those killers? To get a sense of whether the Indian media is alive and kicking, it is important to know if it is performing the basic task of informing, entertaining, and making people aware of current affairs so that they can judge for themselves the facts as they are to help them form their own conclusions. An additional role the media plays is to hold a mirror up to society through its depiction of the current developments and issues, help build public opinion and speak truth to power both political and economic. It is for this reason that the media reflects the world through news, views and analysis. News is an expression of fact-based information that is presented freely, fairly and with independence. Views are also fact-based, but these are opinions and these reflect a specific perspective on an issue that could be different from another viewpoint. Analysis is also fact-based, but it explains what a certain development or an issue means and what it implies. As you can see, all the key streams of the media, news, views and analysis have one common factor, facts. Remember that analysis too is based on facts, but it takes the issues and developments forward to impart greater understanding. Not surprisingly, therefore, news that makes a greater impact on readers is often enriched with good analysis. Views on the other hand are subjective and can be different from other views, but a good media platform allows for all kinds of views, irrespective of the views of those who run that platform. It is this combination that makes the media a reflection of our society, helps inform people, makes them aware and educate them. It even helps address concerns and problems in our society and the governance system to bring about improvements. Yet, the perception of the media has undergone a significant change in the last few years. There was a time when the media was extolled, worshipped almost, as an agent for reflecting the reality around us and bringing to light what is wrong and what is right. But today, the popular perception of the media is one where journalists or media representatives are treated with far less respect than before. Media's image has suffered. And as they say, the image cannot be any different from the reality. The media, in fact, 
is failing to live up to the high ideals for which it was known and respected for. Popular films, particularly from Bollywood, are often an accurate measure of how society views a certain profession or an issue. As far as the Indian media is concerned, you would notice how an Indian journalist is depicted in many Indian films, often as a highly opinionated and biased, if I may use the word jholawala, thrusting a mic to anyone he or she seems to, uh, to uh, know, find out, and often asking what would be considered by most of us inane. The reduction of the journalist into a near comic character reflects how the society's perception of the media has deteriorated and that is mostly because of the kind of television journalism that you have been exposed to in recent times. But the overall perception of the media is not what its original purpose or mandate had helped it build over the years. And this deterioration has taken place most likely because of the way the boundaries between news, views and analysis have been blurred in large sections of the Indian media. This has been an unhealthy trend. It started with the television media where it became almost fashionable. The anchor would not just deliver the news, but along with that he or she will offer a certain stance or a comment. Done with limitations and in small doses. The, attractive, uh, sorry, uh, yeah. the attractiveness and the reception of news improved, of course. But those limitations were soon abandoned and news which relied on sacrosanct facts was compromised by views of the anchor. Analysis too suffered from this affliction. Analysis always ought to be based on facts and there should be no comments. But journalism soon became a victim of this unhealthy cross-fertilization between news, views and analysis. The net loser of this entire exercise was the credibility that lay behind journalism. While journalism became more attractive, and less boring, the credibility quotient of journalism suffered. The concept of passionate objectivity can be turned on its head if it is not practiced with restraint and responsibility. Unfortunately, in the name of passionate objectivity, journalism in the last many years has allowed its credibility tag to be damaged. And this has happened because Passion has got the better of objectivity. On top of this has come the international perception of the media and its depiction of how it has been functioning of late in India. The World Press Freedom Index, produced by Reporters Without Borders, shows the Indian media in poor light. What does this index do? To quote, the index ranks 180 countries and regions according to the level of freedom available to journalists. It is a snapshot of the media freedom situation based on an evaluation of pluralism, independence of the media, quality of legislative framework and safety of journalists in each country and region. It does not rank public policies even if governments obviously have a major impact on their country's ranking, nor is it an indicator of the quality of journalism in each country or region." Unquote. What does the index for 2019 say about India? Once again, I should cite the findings and it is quite revealing. Violence against journalists, including police violence, attacks by Maoist fighters and reprisals by criminal groups or corrupt politicians is one of the most striking characteristics of the current state of press freedom in India. At least six Indian journalists were killed in connection with their work in 2018. A number of doubts surround a seventh case. These murders highlighted 
the many dangers Indian journalists face, especially those working for non-English language media outlets in rural areas. Attacks against journalists by supporters of Prime Minister Narendra Modi increased in the run-up to general elections in the spring of 2019. Those who espouse Hindutva, the ideology that gave rise to Hindu nationalism, are trying to purge all manifestations of anti-national thought from the national debate. The coordinated hate campaigns waged on social networks against journalists who dared to speak or write about subjects that aggravate Hindutva followers are alarming and include calls for the journalist concerned to be murdered. The campaigns are particularly virulent when the targets are women. The emergence of the Me Too MOOP campaign in the media in 2018 has lifted the veil on many cases of harassment and sexual assault to which women reporters have been subjected. Criminal prosecutions are meanwhile often used to gag journalists critical of the authorities, with some prosecutors invoking Section 124A of the Penal Code, under which sedition is punishable by life imprisonment. The mere threat of such a prosecution encourages self-censorship. Finally, coverage of regions that the authorities regard as sensitive, such as Kashmir, continues to be very difficult. Foreign reporters are barred from Kashmir and the internet is often disconnected there. When not detained, Kashmiri journalists working for local media outlets are often the targets of violence by paramilitaries acting with the central government's tacit consent." Unquote. These are not my words. I'm just reproducing the, the Reporters Without Bound, um, Borders, their report on Indian media for 2019. Remember that these findings came before what happened in Kashmir last month. Nevertheless, the challenges before the media can be therefore be easily gauged by the comment made by those who prepared this report. The Indian media's rank in the index placed it at a low 140 in 2019 out of 180 countries. Two notches lower than what it was in 2018. It is remarkable that from 2013 to 2016, the Indian media's rank had been improving and 2016, it was 133. But since then, it has been steadily declining. The points assigned to the Indian media is 45.67. Higher the score, the lower is your rank in Press Freedom Index. That year, Norway occupied the top rank with a score of 7.82 and India had got a rank of 45.67. And Turkmenistan, which is the 188th country, the, the lowest rank, had a score of 85.44. Of course, I mean, there's a lot to rejoice also. The Indian media is better than China at 177, better than Bangladesh at 150, and better than Pakistan at 142. But also consider how UK at 33 and the US at 48 are way above the Indian media in terms of press freedom. Those of you looking for pointers on who could possibly kill the Indian media have got their answers. Even if we assume that the Indian media is not yet dead, the threats as outlined by the report of the World Press Freedom Index are for all to see. The dangers are too obvious to be ignored. So far, therefore, we have described how the Indian media practitioners, I include myself as one of them, have undermined the spirit of the media by blurring the red lines that should separate news from views and from analysis. And this situation has been made more complicated by the external reality of attacks and violence perpetrated against journalists thanks to a new political mindset and regime. This is a heady mix of journalists themselves embarking on a path of flawed journalism and the physical environment getting adverse for them to practice their profession. But there were many more challenges and drawbacks that Indian journalism has been suffering from the last couple of decades. Let me then dwell on three specific challenges and they are all internal challenges that the Indian media has been confronted with in the last few decades. 
particularly after the economic reforms of 1991. This analysis will also help us understand who or what has been responsible for the current state of the Indian media. The first big internal challenge has come from the metamorphosis that the Indian media has undergone in the last few years. This is the metamorphosis in which the media, which was seen as a mission, has ceased to be one. It has become a business. You will recall that the origin of the Indian media is always traced to the country's independence movement. The local media did play a key role in promoting the cause of ushering in freedom for the country from British rule. Several media owners were also enthused by that spirit of securing the country's independence. There was a positive confluence of forces. Media one owners worried less about making profit from their newspapers and other publications as they believed that they were promoting a national cause. Similarly, journalists embraced the profession caring little for the financial gain they would make from the job by way of salaries. An outcome of this mindset that endured for a long time and lasted for the first few decades after independence meant that journalists treated their jobs as a mission and the media owners did not treat their publications as a business. Quite ironically, the media not as a business but as a mission had many adverse consequences for future growth of Indian media. At one level, the media industry remained largely a preserve of those who had other businesses to make money from. So that even when their media outfits did not make money, they were not too bothered. They wore the idea of running a media outfit as a badge of honor and also used it as soft power while dealing with the government. Owning a media helped the owner build a relationship with the politicians belonging to both the ruling party and to the opposition. Consequently, modernization and investment in the media by way of embracing new technology or building skills suffered a great deal. Media owners would argue that their media operations did not yield any profits and therefore they kept them alive with the money they earned from the other businesses. From the journalist's point of view, media as a mission had its own peculiar implications. Journalism became a choice as a profession, mostly for those who accepted it as a cause and therefore were willing to work at pitifully low salaries. There were a few talented journalists who joined the profession because of their commitment to the cause of journalism, but the rest were there because they didn't have any other options. Media as a mission thus was a mixed blessing. It helped media prosper as a profession with independence but suffered due to the lack of investment in skills, modernization and technology. Things changed in the 1980s and this is what is called from the frying pan to the fire. The emergence of media owners who believed that newspapers and other publications could be run as a business did result in more investment in modernization, technology, business strategies, greater focus on marketing, and reskilling as well as retraining of manpower and primary journalists. Media houses were no longer the same. They realized that with India's demographic dividend with a low penetration of the media, the potential for media growth was huge and these could be tapped for financial gain. In short, the media need not be a mission but could be a profitable business. This also meant that the trend of companies publishing newspapers as an operation in addition to their main business underwent a, a, a subtle change. Companies began redrafting their media business strategies. This led to the birth of a new business model. And that was the second internal challenge for the media industry. In this new business model, the media companies began chasing circulation to build a strong readership base, on the strength of which they could raise advertising revenues. One relatively easy way of building readership was to reduce the price at which newspapers or publications were being sold. Once the price was reduced, the hope was 
that there would be more readers. Thus, there were newspaper companies that launched promotional campaigns suggesting that the leader will guard the reader. In other words, the leader among the newspaper companies will guard the reader by reducing newspaper prices. Underneath that campaign was a business strategy. Reduce newspaper prices, increase newspaper circulation, and on the basis of higher readership, get a larger share of the advertisement pie in the market. Soon at the start of the 1990s, newspaper prices began falling and newspaper circulation numbers started shooting up. The advertising revenue was cornered by those who had reduced prices and boosted their circulation. After all, the advertisements would go to those newspapers who were read by more people. In a few years, a dramatic change happened to the business dynamics of Indian newspapers. The share of advertisement revenue as a percent of total newspaper costs began rising. At the same time, the share of revenues collected from readers as the price of the newspapers began falling as a percent of the total cost of producing newspapers. Today, almost 80% of the cost of producing a newspaper is financed from advertisement revenues. This was in sharp contrast to what prevails in other developed newspaper markets. You might argue that the leader, that is the newspaper publishers, was indeed guarding the readers. Newspaper prices were low or had not kept pace with inflation, giving the readers the bonanza of sorts. And the cost of producing a newspaper was being borne by advertisers. But hang on, that was a mistaken notion. The idea of advertisers taking care of 80% of newspaper publishers' cost turned out to be a flawed business model. It has over the years given the advertisers such a hold on the running of newspapers that the media's independence has come under attack. If advertisers know that the bulk of the newspaper's cost is being financed by them, it is only natural that at some point the advertisers would ask for a special treatment, a special dispensation, or even a special coverage from the newspaper concerned. After all, how otherwise would the advertisers justify to their shareholders their decision to spend a good chunk of money on newspapers by way of advertisements? This trend took another dangerous course. Various forms of advertisements were being proposed to masquerade as news, call them sponsored sections or native content. The problem is that readers cannot always make a distinction between what is paid news and what is editorial news. The notorious paid news controversy also arose from this flawed model where newspaper publishers were encouraged to boost their advertisement revenues. This led to media companies making serious compromises on editorial integrity. So did the leader guard the reader? Not really. The flawed business model has done enough damage to the credibility of the media. Today, the classic distinction between advertisement or advertiser paid news and editorially driven news has blurred in many news publications. If the media has been killed, it is this flawed business model that is largely responsible. This model was flawed because it struck at the root of what actually journalism stood for. Remember that both advertising and journalism are based on content. But the key difference between advertising and journalism is that while the former is a message coming from a commercial standpoint, the latter is a message coming from an editorially led team that seeks to present or analyze news from a fair and independent perspective. This principle of maintaining a distinction between the two types of messages gets seriously violated when the advertiser's financial power puts an end to disclosures and disclaimers to inform readers what all is a paid message that is an advertisement and what is an editorial message that is a message arising out of the professional judgment. The third challenge arises from the rapid technological changes that have swept the media industry in the last few decades. 
Technology has impacted the Indian media at three distinct levels. One, on the functional aspects of the media. Two, on the entire media scene in the country. And three, on the print media's existential survival. Let us first look at the functional aspects of the media and what impact technology has had on it. Remember that this is linked to the media industry's gradual recognition of the need for modernization and induction of technology to make media a profitable venture. Thus, in the last couple of decades, technology has made the media products and platforms more efficient and cost-effective. But in the process, it has obliterated many disciplines. And the goals of efficiency and cost-effectiveness have often overridden the goals of quality journalism. Already, as many as four different disciplines in the production of a publication or a newspaper have been wiped out, and the different tasks performed by these erstwhile four disciplines are now the responsibility of only one discipline. Let me explain. The jobs that were performed by the lino operator producing the typeset material in lead, by the page maker who would design the pages either on the metal or on the page, by the proofreader who would go over the edited copies to make sure that the final copy is error free, and the sub editor who would edit the copy and give headlines, choose pictures, and create quote boxes to make the presentation attractive. All these different tasks are now performed by the sub-editor. This was not so even 20 years ago. So you have supplanted four different kinds of people with one person. Imagine the load of all these functions on one person. Of course, technology played a huge role in it, but the fact is that all these four tasks have certain deliverables. The need for those deliverables has not gone away. So while technology has made possible the collapsing, collapsing of four tasks into one task, the need for training and retraining the sub-editor who would now perform the three additional tasks in addition to her own should have become more paramount. But in reality, little attention was paid to reskill the sub-editors or in using the surplus generated by technology-induced collapsing of four tasks into one discipline for improving the compensation package for sub-editors so that persons who are hired for this critical job are of a higher skill level. While the media publishers gained by making a little more money through the technology-enabled savings, but the quality of journalism suffered. Now this process to my mind is not ended yet. With more technology coming in, you will find more disciplines getting collapsed into s s fewer disciplines, but the need for training and retraining gets more, but that nobody is bothered about. You might call it an own goal scored by the media industry against itself, but its consequences on journalism were quite adverse. If the Indian media is poorer than what it is, a few, it was a few decades ago, and if you are debating why the Indian media has been killed or who has killed it, the culprit is the media industry's brazen negligence of the need for professional enhancement. A similar negligence was shown with regard to the need for developing and upgrading the quality of journalist writers as the challenges of graduating from pure news to news plus or news analysis became more pressing. A second technology-induced attack on the Indian media took place because of global developments. The birth and growth of the FANG, F -A -A -N -G, in the early 21st century have changed the media scene in the Western world. But its impact on India has been no less significant. FANG or companies such as Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, and Google have begun to corner the media space not only in terms of content but also in respect of media revenues. With revenue flows being increasingly controlled by the FANG, Indian media publishers like the global media houses have suddenly been confronted 
with a new challenge of creating content that could get more easily sent to these companies for global distribution. It's a globalization of a different type. But in the process, they also mortgaged a good chunk of their revenues to these Western companies. Not only was media content influenced by what FANG dictated, thanks to their algorithm-based viewership demands, but there is also a serious danger now of the Indian media publishers becoming increasingly dependent on these global media giants for their revenues. This threat to the Indian media is a lose-lose situation. At one level, Indian media companies are encouraged to create content that FANG would like them to provide because that is what would fetch more viewership or readership. At another level, the revenue flows for Indian media companies are becoming slower and weaker. Technology has created new media behemoths whose global footprints are large and are threatening the existing and future potential of local and regional media houses, including those in India. The third aspect of the technology-induced challenge pertains to the print media in particular. The rise of the internet has not been an unmixed blessing for the media in general and the Indian media in particular. Digital journalism or websites has allowed more people or readers to access content at a fraction of a cost they would have to incur earlier. For a country like India, this was seen as a big boon. But at the same time, the emergence of the internet platform has meant an existential and financial threat to the print media. Every media house in India has a website that carries the content it produces for its print platform. And that content on the website is by and large available free without any entry cost for the reader. But the same content on the print platform is not freely available. This has stunted readership growth for the print media. Why would you pay for buying a newspaper if you could access the same content free on your smartphone, on your laptop, or on your desktop computer? Not surprisingly, the growth in the print media's readership numbers has been contained, and in some segments, it is even contracted. The irony is that the print media continues to be heavily dependent on the revenues from advertisements carried in the print publications. The advertisement revenues from the internet are still very negligible. Internet advertisements may be growing rapidly, but their total value is still about half of what the print advertisements continue to get. As Matthew Arnold had moaned in one of his poems, but now the old is out of date, the new is not yet born. The Indian media's old world is gone, while its new world is yet to be born. The Indian media's existing source of revenues is shrinking, while its new alternative world of revenues from the internet is yet to grow at a viable space. Some print publications have tried hard to build a model where they want to charge the internet visitors for their content, but such efforts are yet to gain in proportion or scale. It is an existential challenge for the Indian print media. The bulk of the entire cost of maintaining content creation and content production teams is borne by the advertisement revenues that come from print advertisements. But the circulation of the print publications is on the decline, adversing, adversely affecting future flow of advertisements. Readers are moving on to digital versions of the same publications which are free. But the advertisement flow for such digital publications is not substantial enough to help the media meet their costs and make both ends meet. Major print publications in many Western countries have responded to this challenge by creating paywalls of different varieties on their websites so that their revenue flows can get better. A few of these publications have also tasted success, actually huge success. With the protection of revenue streams, these Western country publications, like the New York Times, have also managed to keep the quality of their content at a high level so that readers are willing to pay for accessing quality content. The Indian media is yet to come out 
with an integrated and concrete strategy to counter this threat. Only a few publications have tried the paywall digital content strategy. With their revenue flows getting affected, they are also skimping on their editorial budgets, which as a consequence is adversely affecting the quality of their content. It's a vicious cycle from which the Indian media has to come out of. Sooner it can come out of it, the better are its chances of not becoming irrelevant and eventually non-existent. If you look outside the media world, you will notice that its external environment is now riddled with a plethora of other challenges as well. The explosion of technology and the rise of the internet have created a multitude of choices for readers. For an Indian publication to hold on to its own readers and create stickiness for its content, the effort has to be many times more. As explained earlier, the media has also ceased to be an arbiter of issues in the public policy domain. Neither in social, economic or political arenas, the media's voice is treated as one of the arbiter for this very reason for a variety of other choices that are available to a reader. Twitter, Facebook, Google News and a large number of websites have meant a feast of news, views and analysis for the readers. Quality may not be consistent or it may even be missing, but this absence or loss is more than made good by quantity and easy access. Indeed, the exalted position of the media is hugely diluted as technology, blogging and social media have made every one of us a media voice. Now this may be a social change, it may be a welcome change, but from the print media perspective, this is not going to be a very, very beneficial change for it. Getting published in good old days would require some effort and passing the editor's test of quality. That is no longer a hurdle. You can create your own blogging website and post your thoughts or use Facebook for communicating or sharing your ideas on any issue with others. In this maze of news, views and analysis, the traditional gatekeepers of information, the media, has lost its preeminent position. It is not an insignificant challenge. If it cannot successfully be face up to it, its future will be a question mark. The government has also played more a none too insignificant role in creating new challenges for the media. Its advertising clout is no less powerful than the private sector advertisers for the media. This is particularly true of a large number of regional publications who depend on advertisements from government and state-owned entities for more than the national publications do. As mentioned earlier, the government in the last few years has also been intolerant of critical pieces of news emanating from the media. The government monitors all publications and their social media engagements far more closely to keep a close watch on how the media is reporting news and commenting on developments. The approach of governments in many states is no different. Needless to say, this has acted as a restraint on the media. The government at the center, so also in the states, also use their clout of policy making in addition to effectively using the lever of advertisements. Decisions such as raising the import duty on newsprint, which most Indian newspapers have to undertake as domestic production of this raw material is inadequate to meet the country's entire newsprint demand and specifying a 26% foreign investment cap on digital media have also contributed to the perception that the government at the center has taken steps that may make the Indian media's existence and operations a little more difficult. Earlier steps on creating new government-run digital platforms for publication of public notices like tenders had already affected the advertisement revenues of newspapers and other publications. The government media engagement under the current regime is also marked by one-sided communication. When the government chooses to convey a certain message, it does so either by using statements, social media tweets, or Facebook posts, or a press meeting where questions on some occasions are not even answered. Thus, a two-way communication that allows a more rounded dissemination of news and developments has become a rarity in the Indian media in the last few years. This has certainly created a fresh challenge for the media's content perspective. Given such a situation, 
where the media itself has created difficult operating conditions for itself. Technology has contributed to the challenges and the government has made its functioning even more challenging. What should the Indian media do? Based on the assessment outlined earlier, three clear steps suggest themselves. One, there is an urgent need for the Indian media to engage in an introspection of how it has harmed its own existence. Whatever be the enormity of the challenges and the adversity of the situation under which it operates, the media must not compromise on the quality of its content, the impartiality and independence of its news management, and on adequate investment in training and retraining of journalists. If journalism has to be rescued, then it must be saved from journalists and journalist organizations who don't pay attention to these ideas. The manner in which journalists and journalist organizations have tried to deal with the challenges so far has not really served the desired purpose. What should, that be, what should they be doing then? That brings us to the second remedial step needed to be taken by the media. It must acknowledge that the march of technology is unstoppable. It must learn to anticipate the changes the technology will bring about. It must accept them as reality and must prepare to deal with them. To remain in denial of what technology or the challenges the FANG group of companies will pose to them is not a prudent approach. Unfortunately, this is what they have been doing so far. The Indian media must recognize its inherent strengths, the spread of its large market, and the diversity of language and culture across the country. The third step would be to relook its business model. The way technology is spreading, it no longer makes sense for the Indian media to remain a prisoner of advertisement revenues. Using technology to its best advantage, the Indian media must collectively decide that the earlier strategy of guarding the reader through price cuts is not sustainable anymore. And particularly in the current context, where the media is faced with challenges from many quarters. There are hardly any industries where the user of the product or services does not pay for what he or she consumes or uses. The Indian media must come round to the view that a time has come when the user, that is a reader in the context of the media, must also pay for the content he or she consumes. Advertisement revenues may still continue to grow, but once the media's overwhelming dependence on advertisers comes down, the many distortions in the Indian media and its many existential challenges could be tackled more effectively. The ultimate salvation for the Indian media is to adopt the principle that the user must pay. If the media in the many Western countries has already fruitfully followed this principle and gained immensely from this, there is no reason why the Indian media should continue to shy away from it. Finally, the Indian media must accept that it too has been responsible for many of its ills. Its failure to address technology issues, its reluctance to invest more in training and retraining of manpower, its aversion to the principle that the user must pay, have all been responsible for the tight situation the Indian media is in at present. Yes, there may be external agents like the FANG group or the government which have made the situation for the Indian media more difficult and challenging, but ultimately it cannot absolve itself for, of its respons irresponsibility, imprudence and negligence to set its own house in order and take steps well in time to fix problems that were staring at them. To return to my original question at the start of my lecture, who killed the Indian media? Let me say that it would be futile to find an answer. As we analyzed the situation a little while ago, the fact of the matter is the Indian media is faced with many challenges, but it is still alive and surviving. It is possible to argue that many attacks have been made to kill the Indian media, but it is still not dead. Even though severely maimed, it can still revive itself. A more relevant question at this point in time would be, why shouldn't the Indian media revive itself? Any attempt at reviving the Indian media must start with the recognition of the problems that confront it. Today, we have made a preliminary attempt 
at identifying those problems, situating them in global, economic, as well as domestic political context. We also discussed some of the remedial measures that should be undertaken. The next step would be to examine the feasibility of these moves and prepare the ground for implementing them. None of those steps suggested is an easy one. But then if we do not discuss them in a public forum like this, we would be failing in our primary duties. And more importantly, if we can refocus our energies even for an hour on what is ailing the Indian media and what needs to be done to revive it or rid it of its problems, we would perhaps achieve at least a part of the larger purpose of this lecture, that is to celebrate the memory of Dr. C.V.S. Sharma. I end my lecture with that hopeful thought. Giving me more hope today is what happened early this morning in Manila. A Hindi journalist, Ravish Kumar, was given the Raymond Maxese Award for his fearless journalism for speaking truth to power. So there is hope. The Indian media is not yet dead. Thank you. Yeah, sure. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. A.K. Bhattacharya, for the wonderful lecture. Very comprehensive and covered a lot of ground. Uh, I, I mean, it, to me, it gave the impression that maybe the in, uh, media is, you know, uh, media is not killed, but probably it is in the ICU. Uh, so, uh, in a critical state. And of course, there is, uh, there are a lot of factors uh, outside of the media that can be blamed. But um, the media people themselves need to, you know, ref uh, reflect on what the situation is and probably work towards its own revival. Uh, on that note, uh, we'll open the session for questions. Uh, maybe three or four, yeah, four or five questions. Uh, Um, good evening, sir. Uh, my name is Abhishek. I'm from MA Communication. So, uh, I had two questions um, for you. Um, first of all, um, whatever happens in international relations, politics, or uh, everything that goes about comes down to business. So, uh, in this uh, time, how should one go about uh, doing um, objective business journalism? Uh, the second question is, um, in uh, one of the things that you mentioned was um, the uh, business side of newspapers or the TV channels. In that, I also want to mention that um, how much do you think has defamation uh, played a role in, in the decline of um, <coughs> news values uh, in the new media? Given that one of the defamation was filed by Reliance Foundation against business standard uh, journalist Ajay Sukla. Uh, and uh, the other one where uh, it was filed against the Financial Express when where it was taken, the article was taken down uh, after the uh, defamation was filed. So uh, how do you think defamation um, affects the uh, quality of journalism? Uh, can you repeat your second question? Uh, what was um, my second question was, uh, how do you think the defamation affects the quality of journalism? Uh, defamation? Yes. Sir. Well, uh, let me uh, 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 first uh, respond to your first question on objective business journalism, am I right? You talked about business journalism. Uh, I, I think, uh, you know, uh, we haven't reached a point uh, where uh, the business dynamics of a newspaper or a publication uh, is uh, impacting the quality of business journalism uh, in, in, uh, in a very prominent way. I am not saying that uh, business journalism doesn't suffer from the ills that I refer to, that how the, the business model where everything is determined by the advertiser because he has a financial muscle, uh, I think it does have an impact. Uh, uh, I think it's very important for the newspapers to do some uh, 
evaluation and uh, a code of conduct is very very important for newspapers you know you will be surprised to know that uh, there are a very few handful of media houses in this country who actually follow a code of conduct in a sense that what a journalist can do and should not do uh, so it is possible to influence either through the organization or through individually it is possible so therefore uh, at an organizational level i think you need to be immune from the influence that advertising can advertisers can peddle and at an individual level uh, you need uh, to be more cautious and be on guard and probably the organization should encourage uh, enunciation and the formulation of codes of conduct that bind uh, a journalist uh, to disclosure of uh, everything that he does uh, for example there are newspapers i know uh, who will have a code of conduct which says that you cannot tape a person while interviewing without getting his permission or you need to make your quarterly investment disclosures to the organization to the editor now and and you, if you look at international publications almost every international publication has got a detailed code of conduct unfortunately in our country media has got a 70 year and more than 70 years if you take back from the pre independence days but the code of conduct for a journalist is still a matter of debate in many organizations and even if there is a code that code is not necessarily followed to the t so i think in answer to your first question i would say that yes uh, the code of conduct is necessity at a individual organization individual level at an organization level you need to you know frame uh, clearer policies and as regards defamation i think defamation uh, laws are very um, can be very oppressive uh, Uh, the examples that you cited i don't think uh, it really materially affected reporting of those matters but defamation laws in our country because they are criminal by nature uh, they have a chilling effect on free speech or expression of ideas uh, so i would not be surprised uh, that uh, with defamation laws what they are and particularly the criminal provisions and now the use of the laws of sedition against journalists um, i mean where if you if you are criticizing uh, let's say the national symbol uh, you you can be taken uh, to jail to so so there 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 are problems there so defamation laws is not alone or not the problem there are other a host of other laws uh, the idea is to decriminalize defamation but if you decriminalize defamation uh, you need to make the civil defamation law uh, a little more stringent and uh, where justice is not delayed uh, the real debate between criminal and civil i mean india is among the few countries now i think criminals defamation and civil defamation both exist side by side the british has did it and we have retained that criminal defamation laws so there are, there was a move in the supreme court about 4 years ago 5 years ago the supreme court in its wisdom said no it went it is it should not be read down so but i think there is a movement i think editors guild of india is trying to revive that proposal to decriminalize defamation that probably probably be the way out but as of now i don't think defamation uh, has led to uh, suppression of news as such but people are more cautious people don't want to get harassed by defamation laws because you can go to jail you know i mean uh, so th th that's uh, that's uh, did i answer your question yeah um hi sir i am aparna from ma communication as well so uh, i have two questions uh what should what do you think should be the approach towards journalism in institutions like this and the importance of practicing journalism or what would be the right way to practice journalism from the root level and the second question is 
uh, it's along the lines of media and censorship what are your views on censorship as such okay um, institutions li like this have got a huge role in my view because um, it's, it's it's important that uh, uh, that the media studies uh, uh, should not uh, just be about um, what a journalist ought to do, what a journalist ought not to do. But I think uh, media studies need to go deeper uh, into the dynamics of how uh, organizations function, how media organizations function. Uh, my sense is, I, I, I will stand corrected if, uh, if any of the faculty corrects me, because I don't know much about it. Uh, my sense is that uh, uh, most uh, media uh, institutes uh, in the country, uh, let me repeat, I don't know much about this department, uh, do not go uh, that much into, uh, into this media organization and what, how, the, how the media is run. And because uh, in my view, every journalist uh, should be taught the way media organizations are run. Uh, in the in the in the in the West, uh, I, I know the the journalist uh, does not look down upon uh, the the uh, the marketing guy in a in a newspaper organization. But in India, uh, I have in my own life have always looked down upon a marketing guy or a sales guy in the newspaper and saying that he's doing an inferior job. Uh, I think it is a flaw and the fault of the way we have grown up uh, on our on our media thing. You know, I, I did not go to a media uh, issue, but uh, I, I am a product of a of a past generation. But I find that even the younger people do not have this a kind of an empathy understanding of what that marketing guy is doing in the media. Uh, I think it is necessary for all media uh, institutes, education institutions to incorporate in their curriculum what a media organization, how it is run, how is the marketing done, how is the sales done. Uh, and I don't see that getting reflected at least uh, in the products that we see when we hire people. So that would be my suggestion. What was your second question? Censorship. Uh, censorship is, uh, is, uh, uh, is obviously uh, something that uh, should be opposed should be questioned uh, because censorship is uh, is is like uh, uh, is uh, it uh, imposes curbs uh, on as long as the that freedom of expression has got a reason you know a reasonable degree the is expressed with with responsibility i don't see any reason why there should be any censorship there was a censorship in this country for about 18 or 20 months in the emergency time it didn't work you know, censorship never works. Uh, a lot of people believe that uh, there is an informal kind of censorship that may be in, in existence. Uh, but I don't think it, uh, censorship as, an, as a tool uh, doesn't really work. Uh, it, uh, it doesn't really work. So even if the government wishes to use it, uh, there are always ways of circumventing it. I mean, the famous example of, uh, of uh, censorship and uh, it being countered by an editor in 1975 when the emergency happened was that uh, uh, the editor uh, was barred from running an editorial uh, or a news item, I think, uh, in his, on the front page. So there was a blank space. So what the editor did was, instead of the report, he published the entire Tagore's poem of where the head is held high and mind is without fear. So he just did that. So I think any government wants to use censorship, it, it boomerangs in the, in the medium to long term. So, but there's a law, as a, as a regressive law, there's no doubt about it. Sir, so I'm Shami. Um, when you say that the Indian media is dying and there's a very little chance of it to be revived, do you think the way to revive from the root would be to give a more, you know, bravado to the students of the universities uh, and by teaching them correct media ethics and to be 
fearless basically uh one correction i i i don't know whether i said uh, media is dead i i think i did try to say that the media is going through a major challenge as as uh, dr malik rightly pointed out media is in the icu you know so i think that would be a correct way of what i said you know uh, i i think uh, you know as a as a university where journalism is taught certainly it's a, it's a good forum uh where uh, media ethics importance of uh these are things should be taught and there is no doubt i'm 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 reasonably certain that these are these are taught in you know but maybe more focus should be there good afternoon sir i am kiran from philosophy department i just want elucidation of couple of points Uh, when you said that uh, circulation of papers is reducing and uh, print media itself is losing interest i am more concerned about the other side of the issue like the consumers why do you think it is falling like uh, ma'am mentioned uh, the book by postman amusing ourselves to death in that uh, there are two strains that i want to look at uh, one is he says that uh, after the rise of telegram more and more irrelevant information is coming into media irrelevant in the sense that it's not actionable do you think because of that uh, people are feeling kind of helplessness and reducing their reading or is it something more pernicious in the way that he talks about aldous huxley's point of view that uh, although there will be books no one will be interested in reading them anymore and the second question i want to ask you about is you also talked about the uh, security of the journalists sorry security of the journalists Uh, okay in the sense yeah so although there have been recent murders about uh, gauri lankesh and others i am more concerned about one uh, that happened around 2013 i guess in up where the journalist was uh, burnt to death in front of his own home and on his death bed he actually accused a sp mla and although it was a death bed allegation nothing was done about it and the family members didn't pursue because the reason they gave was like the media vans will be here for 3 4 weeks once they leave there isn't anything that we can do we have to deal with these people every day is there any mechanism to look at one issue and see it through till the end in india like any uh, justice movements that look at these murders specifically and look them through through the judiciary okay uh, good questions uh i think i think you know the circulation is not uh uh, uh is something which is uh, uh uniform story and the, it is the english publications whose circulation is falling very rapidly uh the regional language newspapers uh, their circulation is still growing uh, so because uh, the potential for growth in the regional publication is still better uh but if you look at uh, the various forecasts and thing even there the growth rate is decelerating and i don't think it is falling because the content is the real issue there i think it is falling because the avenues for consuming information has got far too many uh with this technology coming in uh and a technology that gives you far greater interactivity uh the print circulation is obviously will be challenged and which is why i said that the media's challenge is that at a time when you know one world is lost and the new world is not born so so what you are actually seeing is that the print which is to give you the advertisement and is to give you the 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 moola and uh, but the 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 smartphone which gives you same news and you are going through the smart news smartphone uh, so th- there is that you know dilemma of sorts that so sooner or later you will see that the print will shrink i mean if you look at uh, the us market the 1700 newspapers have shut down in the last 3 years uh india still has got far too many newspapers uh, for a country of our size uh, but the problem that you see is that people are moving away from newspapers new guys are not joining 
newspapers. And that is because the new media is better off. Now, newspapers do have a role to play in my view. I mean, I think, and that's where uh, you need to go in for greater investment in print media. So that, you know, I mean, uh, I, I still think the economist model is a model that will survive any technological challenge. Because uh, the, whereas Time and Newsweek are almost virtually finished. Because the economists realize that uh, news can be commoditized. So time was not pure news, but it was sort of hovering around news and they were focusing on news. But economists did not, its news is the least read section in the economist. It's got a two page section which is on news. The rest is something that the economist editorial leadership thinks it is necessary for the world to know, whether it is the, the dance of democracy in the world is coming to an end, whether it is uh, anything else, whether the farmer, whether there is an Amazon forest being burnt. So if you look at Amazon uh, uh, economist's approach, that is the approach where the print can survive in my view. So uh, in India, what is happening is that in the media fraternity, in the media community, we are not discussing all this. Uh, we, are f f uh, we are even wary of taking the next step. How do you make sure that we get more quality content and get more revenue on that content, you know? So the real challenge is going to come maybe two years, three years down the line when that young man who is looking, was still buying the Hindi newspaper or the Telugu newspaper, who will move away from there and he will consume the same content free on the smartphone. What will you do then? You are completely gone. So I think that's the real challenge. Uh, the challenge on the security, I think, they, they, you know, we have a regulatory gap here. Uh, I, I don't think that this country has got a regulator called Press Council of India, but as everybody knows, it is a toothless body. It doesn't have any powers. It is on the contrary, it is actually sides with the government in, in filing a petition in the court you know, which goes against the freedom of the press. So, so it is not really a regulator. Uh, so you need probably uh, more, uh, you know, media bodies which look into these issues. Uh, very often, you know, I am I'm I'm, I'm also associated with the Editors Guild of India. I am General Secretary there. And we often get this request that should Editors Guild of India get into this, of the kind of thing that I'm, I'm glad you raised this issue because this is something that is being engaging our attention also. So I don't think government will do it. Uh, I don't know whether the media organizations, the, the you know Indian Newspaper Society, which is the body of the media organization, should get together because it is not the core concern. It is purely a journalistic concern. So it has to come from a journalistic body. So maybe you know a press association of India or Editors Guild of India should take this up and make this an important article of faith and take issues forward. But I take this point very seriously from you. Hello, sir. Yeah. Uh, I am Sumit from MA Communication. You are uh, General Secretary of Editors Guild of India. Edi Editors Guild of India was founded after the emergency. Recently what happened in Kashmir and uh, the clampdown of communication system, Editors Guild of India condemned that after PCI statements. For that also Editors Guild of India uh, clamped down. But what about the media itself? Media is talking in a sense that okay, nothing is happening in Kashmir. Nothing is, uh, like everything is uh, going in control. But uh, what about the institutions? Uh, is uh, Editors Guild of India uh, is going to uh, talk about these issues, about the media houses, about the institution, they are clamping down the issues regarding uh, uh, Kashmir right now? Well, you know, I, I cannot speak on behalf of Editors Guild of India here. I've come here in individual capacity. Uh, but what I can tell you is this, Editors Guild of India is exercised about it and I think we issued quite a few statements and we are in touch with people. Uh, it's a serious issue what is happening on, on, the, on the media coverage of what is happening in Kashmir uh, is itself 
a comment that uh, and you know uh, we have done a com comparative study of uh, simple headlines of international newspapers on on Kashmir and the headlines that Indian newspapers have carried and that itself is a story in my view uh, but uh, uh, Indian journalism is also uh, a victim of uh, the current prevailing Indian society's mindset, which is not uh, a very uplifting thought right now. So the Indian media is suffering from those weaknesses as well. I, I will not say that the Indian media has covered itself with glory with Kashmir. Of course not. I didn't answer your question, I think. Yeah. I'm speaking from outside the media world and I'm speaking about somebody who's a consumer of the media, sure. a reader of the media and I wanted to ask again about uh, nuancing the reader as well, uh, that there's not one kind of me reader, there are, but some of us are passive readers and are doing nothing about it, some of us are actively contributing to the algorithm of the business model you're talking about and um, on the other hand we also have something about uh, everybody now has a media voice. And so the code of ethics for readership, like is the business model going to even take that into consideration and what is the role of the consumer and the reader in the death of the Indian media? Because we are also somewhere deeply yeah. implicated in that story and to really nuance it to see how we have as a reader, as a consumer played a role in that uh, killing and what can be done, uh, you know, how to sort of uh, monetize the readership role, how we all sort of contribute and if that would be… Yeah, I, I, I think you have uh, raised an interesting point. I, I never looked at it that way actually, you know, but uh, one should perhaps. Uh, I often wondered uh, that, um, uh, you know, uh, the Indian readers uh, celebrated uh, the fall in newspaper prices in which started in 89, 90, coinciding with the economic reforms. Uh, and uh, I also benefited as a reader. Uh, my newspaper bills came down, you know. Um, and in, uh, if you take the inflation rate uh, from the 1960s, a newspaper price in India can never be 2 rupees or 2 rupees 50 paisa now. No way. It should not be. Uh, but lowering the price has helped the readers also. Uh, but where Indian media has gone wrong is uh, not using uh, its, uh, its readership base uh, to build and enhance its content creating ability, you know, and skills. Now, whether the reader should have a role to play, I, I don't know, because a reader as a consumer, uh, the Indian media has failed to convince the Indian consumer that uh, uh, you must uh, pay for it. Uh, and uh, uh, when we talk among newspaper people internally, uh, the newspaper will say it's very difficult. You know, you cannot expect uh, a consumer to pay. Uh, after all, uh, it's spreading information. There's also this internet freedom issues come in, you know that it has come through the internet. So uh, when uh, I, uh, excuse me for talking about business standard, I, I told myself I will not talk about business standard here. Uh, business standard has got a paywall and you do not know the hate mail that we receive. We have a very strict paywall and as a result, as a, uh, we, uh, we face a problem with our writers, we face a problem with our readers, we face a problem with everybody. And, but we went for the paywall because we realize that our advertisements are not coming from print. So, we cannot give the paper we are selling, we are one of the costliest papers, next to Hindu. Now, I think Hindu has understood, the Hindu has understood that the reader must pay. And look at the drop in its circulation, it's a huge drop in its circulation never seen before. So, my sense is the reader will never understand. It is the job is of the seller here, that if I'm, I, I want to make a product sell well, uh, I must make sure that at a price which is little more, little higher, you will still pick up my product. 
Unfortunately, uh, Indian media's failure is also creating content that is so compelling. When I read a piece in the Financial Times or Wall Street Journal or Washington Post or New York Times, I think it is worth the price that I pay. So I think it is the Indian media's failure also to create a sustainable flow of content that is so compelling. So without having tried that, and, and Indian media hasn't done it because Indian media has been skimping on this on, it, on its you know enhancement budgets. That how do you reskill your own people? So having not done that, you are faced with this that listen, I can't offer you A class material. I'll give you B class material. Okay, you don't want to pay me? Don't pay me. I will get my money from the advertisers. So it's a very compromising kind of an approach, which is not. Uh, is going to be a long-term solution, you know. So, but imagine what what uh, the economist has done. They keep raising prices. Financial Times cost is uh, one pound, which is uh, you know seventy rupees a paper. Now, even if you take the purchasing power parity and the standard of living index and all that, even Bangladesh, Bangladesh paper newspaper prices are much more than ours. Now, what is it that we have done by which? I think we have scored our own goal in this, that we are not giving readers the content that they deserve, but we are not willing to price it. Uh, so, you know, it's a, it's a very funny situation. You know, newspapers is probably the only product, I think is the only product which is sold twice. You know, first is the, is the space in the newspaper or a, or a magazine which is sold. And once that is advertisement, and then when the advertisement comes, you put the advertisement and then you sell it to the reader. And the, the, but the, the, the beauty of this is that the second sale determines the first sale. So the Indian media owners at the 1980s realized this game that, listen, my second sale will influence my first sale. So my second sale is to the reader, so I will boost my second sale first. So by reducing prices, and then I will get my first sale. So it's a complex model, but I think we have got, got, got caught in a bind. So it is very difficult unless we get out of it and say we start afresh. Thank you so much. I'm sure there are more questions, but you can interact with Mr. Bhattacharya over tea. Uh, so thank you so much, Mr. A.K. Bhattacharya. A big round of applause for uh, AKB. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I now request uh, Janardhan to please uh, deliver a vote of thanks. Yeah. A respected guest of today's event, Mr. A.K. Bhattacharya ji, uh, and uh, Dean SN School, and head of the Department of Communication. Professor Kanchan, I am glad to propose a vote of thanks on behalf of the Department of Communication, SN School of Arts and Communication, and also on my own behalf. At the outset, I thank Sri A.K. Bhattacharya ji for coming all the way to deliver the CVS Sharma, Dr. CVS Sharma Memorial Lecture. Thank you, Dr. Bhattacharya ji for your thought-provoking lecture on the present status of Indian journalism and also for engaging the students' interactions. I, I thank uh, the Dean of SN School, Professor Tirumal, for providing guidance and support in organizing this event. And I also thank our head of the department, Professor Kanchan, for her day-to-day -day monitoring of this event right from the inception of uh, this memorial uh, lecture. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Kanchan. And uh, I also thank uh, the support given by this uh, 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 School of uh, Humanities for providing this hall and all the logistics. I thank the Dean as well as uh, his team including the technical staff here, who provided all the mic and everything. 
I thank all the faculty of Department of Communication for supporting to in organizing this event. I thank the teaching and the non-teaching staff of uh, Department of Communication as well as uh, SN School, all other departments. And I thank the volunteers who are working here, uh, contributing in providing the logistics, especially in videography, photography, and live streaming that we have been doing from the beginning. And uh, I place on record, it is all being done by the second year students of MA in communication, RVP. And I also place on record the logistical supports provided by uh, Mr. Ramesh and Mrs. Venkat Lakshmi and Sudhakar Garu uh, to our students uh, for doing all these activities of videography, photography and live streaming. And uh, not but, uh, la last but not uh, last but not uh, least, I thank all the participants, especially the faculty colleagues from all the schools of the university and also all the students. Thank you very much.